pain is going to happen regardless. I just don't want to waste the pain, whether that's physical pain, emotional pain, whatever it is, like, don't waste it, lean into it and see what it's telling you. If it's physical pain, it's telling you there's a problem, you know? So how can we help our body in this journey? Thank you for tuning in to Trevor Talks Podcast, where we talk to real people about real topics and real stories. Today's guest is an actress, encourager, and such a sweet soul that I know for a fact you'll all get to know and love. You may have seen her in the Kendrick Brothers' latest hit movie, Overcomer, or even from her lead in the film Like Arrows. Maybe you saw her in Nashville on TV or in NF's If You Want Love music video and several other music videos from friends of the show. She has a new film out now on Pure Flix called A Match Made at Christmas, and I'm so grateful to finally have her here with us. Here's my interview with Micah Lynn Hansen. Micah, like, it's been a year. Like, we've been trying to do this forever. So we're here. We made it. (laughs) We are, finally. (laughs) It's like it. we met for the first time at the Overcomer red carpet, mm-hmm. and I could just tell you had this spirit about you that was like, not go getter, but just like you're super thrilled to be there. It's like you had been working for this a long time, <laughs> and here we are promoting a film that you're a lead in, which is yeah. not your first time doing a lead, but it's it never gets old seeing friends succeed, so I'm happy we're able to sit here and talk about it today. Oh, me too. Thank you so much for bringing me on. I love this so much. Oh, of course. So how's everything been? I know the past year has been interesting for filming and such. So Mm -hmm. what did that look like for you? Yeah. So actually this film that's coming out, Match Made at Christmas, is um, we were slated to shoot it in March of 2020. So I was currently driving across the country uh, from like Tennessee, where I had been living in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I had just moved to L.A., so I was driving from Tennessee with the rest of my stuff. I was going up to, we were shooting in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is my hometown, which is super special. So this film was shooting up in my hometown, mountain resort town in Idaho. I'm halfway across the country with everything I own in my car. And I get the call that we have to shut down because of the pandemic. And I was like heartbroken. I was like, oh my gosh, like it's never going to happen. This film's never going to happen. But I was like, well... I'm on my way home. I'll just stay. My parents still live in my childhood home. So I was like, I'll just stay with my parents. We'll wait it out. You know, the two weeks, flatten the curve, that whole thing. Um, that went really well. (laughs) Um, so I ended up just staying in my hometown and we were actually able to shoot, um, in September and October of last year of 2020. So we were able to shoot during the pandemic. Nobody got sick. Everybody was safe and healthy. And it was just, a total God thing. So yeah. Yeah. It was interesting time. I I think that was the only thing I shot in 2020. So (laughs) yeah, I think it's like one of the things that really stood out, like from the get go with meeting you is you're simplistic and you don't seem to be in a rush to get to the next thing, which is very Mm -hmm. rare to find in today's day and age. It's like when you find someone that's actively like invested in what's in front of them, that's super special and you carry Mm -hmm. that super well. Now with recording all of this during the pandemic, was it really weird compared to shooting beforehand? And I want to talk about the film in particular, but there's something about like, we had Nathan Clarkson on and he was talking about like living in New York city during the pandemic. And that's a whole lot different than me being in Georgia and then Nashville and such. Mm -hmm. Like what was it like Mm -hmm. shooting a film in a pandemic? That sounds (laughs) interesting all on its own. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, thankfully we're in a really small town up in, like I said, Northern Idaho. There's not a lot here. Um, we didn't have to shut down too badly just because it's not a super populated area. Um, but it was different just because everybody, if you weren't on camera, you know, you had to have a mask, you had to have those types of things. You couldn't be as like, I don't know. I really like connecting with people that I'm working with, whether it's, you know, the lady running crafty or whatever. And like, this was a small, really small, intimate indie film group. So we did still get to be close with everybody, but you know, it's just different. You know, there were some times where a couple people on set broke down in tears because they were scared that they might get something or pass it on to their elderly mother or, you know, like there were moments of fear, but I just got to, um, you know, come alongside those people and just pray with them and just, um, you know, know that like God's got us, God has this production. Um, while it's not actually a faith-based film, 
pretty much everybody on set are all believers. The whole production team, the writers, directors, producers are all direct, are like believers. And so we had that. We started every day with prayer, you know, just for everybody's safety through the pandemic. So if this was a SAG film, I have no idea what it would have been like. <laughs> I don't think we would have been shooting if it was a SAG film, quite honestly. Yeah. But um, yeah, we just invited the Holy Spirit to help us through the whole process. And um, while it was different and we lost a lot of locations because of it, we lost certain things because of the pandemic and we had to wait months to even shoot it. Um, yeah. But God really used it all to help the film in the, in the long run, I think. Come on. And for this film in particular, A Match Made at Christmas, tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about it, why you're so excited for people to finally see it and what it means to you. Yeah. So it's got to be the most near and dear to my heart film that I've done thus far, yeah. because not only is it shot in my hometown, um, it's shot in my best friend childhood's home. Like I've known them since I was two years old. I'm actually, this is their house I'm in right now. So this is Holly's house. <laughs> um, awesome. they, uh, we used, uh, their home as my character's home. So it's shot like in my hometown, in my best friend's childhood home, you know, a lot of my costume pieces were like my grandpa's flannel or, you know, like, it's just, it's so special to shoot something, to get paid, to go to your hometown and shoot something is like, yeah. I don't know that there's many actors who have ever gotten to do that. And I just feel so incredibly blessed. And then on top of it, it is also, I'm a first time producer on this. I'm an associate producer Come on this project, on. which is super cool. And it's just, it's amazing getting to work with a bunch of like-minded people. And the story is so cute. Like so cute. The best way I can describe it is like, Hallmark Christmas movie meets like a more gritty, like nineties rom-com kind of sure. vibe. So there's a little more grit to it than like Hallmark, but it's, you know, it's very feel good, you know, typical small town girl who loves Christmas meets the cynical big city boy, you know, who hates Christmas, <laughs> that kind of a plot, but with a lot more heart to it. Yeah, and I was watching through the trailer and it looks like y'all had a good time filming this thing. And oh, a lot did. of that can probably be credited, uh, obviously, do, like, I can't imagine how comfortable I would be shooting something in my best friend's house that I grew up with in yes. the hometown. Like, for me, it's a whole lot different. Like, I obviously like the brand Trevor Talks was just a blog and stuff before it became a podcast. But being mm -hmm. able to just I'm not signed with anyone like I fully fund everything. So being able to have that freedom, I can't yeah. imagine doing it anywhere else. Like I'm at my house here in Georgia now, which you can see Frito Ray, my dog over here. Asleep. Yes, I saw he him was, earlier. He's so yeah, he was being pretty vocal at like every time the Amazon truck or something would go by. So I had to bring him in here. Wow. And like, it's comfortable, like I feel good about it. Mm -hmm. And we did the Dove Awards a few weeks ago. And I mean, I'm not saying I don't like doing the in-person thing, but like when we met at the Overcomer premiere, red carpet interviewing is like speed dating. It's like <laughs> bare, bare bones <clears throat> stuff. You don't have a lot of time to prep. Mm -hmm. And doing this, it it's like when you do an indie film compared to doing a SAG film, you know, like you have huge budgets for some, some are like mm -hmm. bare bones. We can hop on and record an interview like this for literally like we don't have to pay for time traveled we don't have to pay for plane mm -hmm. tickets hotels a crew to come do it yep. we can just set up a camera here and do it and a lot yeah. of people are like oh i have to have this big budget to do this and that but that's not the case like in 2021 to be a musician you don't need a manager you don't need a booking agent all you need is an internet connection and talent to be an influencer or whatever which i hate that word it's so overused <laughs> like it just is. figuring out like, okay, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And yeah. where do you want me to start? For me, I started in my home. For a lot of other people, they started in theater and doing things mm -hmm. in their hometown. So I want to really dive into your story in particular, though. You were born in California, and then you moved to Idaho. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about where all of this started for you. Yeah, so I was homeschooled in northern Idaho. <clears throat> And I, because I was homeschooled, we didn't have like a theater program or anything, but I did a couple like sketches with my church and, um, I don't know. I just, I kind of just like had an, a knack for it. And then my sister brought home like a newspaper clipping. Like we didn't even have internet. Like this is, you know, we lived way out. Like we didn't have service sure. or anything. Um, she brought home a newspaper clipping with a advertisement saying that there was auditions for a children's musical theater production in this little playhouse in my hometown called Lake City Playhouse. 
And they were like the next day. And now mind you, I was the excruciatingly shy, awkward kid who could not make eye contact with somebody to like save my life. And, but I always knew that I wanted to be doing this. Like nobody else knew, but I knew. And so I went and sang acapella for this audition. Like my parents were like, who are you? What have you done with our daughter? Kind of a thing. (laughs) And, um, I got cast in it and the lady who was the director for it, she was a believer and got me involved in CYT, which is Christian youth theater. And I just getting on stage, there's no way to explain it other than it just, I just knew how to do it. It felt like home. I felt comfortable up there, which is again, bizarre because shy, awkward kid doesn't, can't talk to people kind of a kid. Like, I mean, when I say like awkward, like, I had like Coke bottle glasses. Like I was just the most awkward child you can imagine. So getting into theater, I always credit getting into theater with giving me a personality because I didn't have one before. Like I just, I didn't. (laughs) So getting into theater just gave me that confidence to like start becoming who I feel like God really created me to be and getting to be on stage and be somebody else for some reason gave me that confidence to do that. But it was just something like, I always loved people watching. I loved watching people and studying them. So it was like, I knew how to put an emotion on, if that makes sense at all. Like I knew how to do that for whatever reason. I don't have any real technical official training. Uh, I just, I just knew how to empathize and how to portray human emotion, I guess. And I just loved it. Like I've always, I've always loved singing. And so getting to be on stage and doing musical theater was just the best of all the world. It was just the best thing ever. So I started there. Um, the lady who was the director of that first production, she ended up being my very first agent. She started in like a film agency. Um, she's now like a producer on Broadway. Like she's doing huge stuff. And I love her. Like I still see her whenever I can. Um, and yeah, she just really believed in me, saw something in me. And I think that's been the biggest part of my story. And my journey is having amazing people believe in me and encourage me because nobody in my family does this. Nobody's in the entertainment industry. I never even knew it was something you can make money at. Like I didn't know it was like, it could be a career path, you know, like I had no idea when I got into it, that that was a thing. Um, But God just always placed people around me. I call them my spiritual bumpers, you know, when you go bowling and you suck at bowling and so you have to like put the, yeah. the bumpers up. Like, that's how I see it. God's just put these, these people in my life that are like the bumpers. And I've just been the, the, <laughs> the bowling ball is just like, bing, bing, like pinballing off of <laughs> these bumpers the whole way down. But he's never let me, I've tried to get in the gutter. Like I've tried to jump over those bumpers and like land in the gutter. And I, I probably have a couple times, but you know, they're always there, like pick me back up and be like, okay, you can start pinballing off of us again. Like, here you go. So, um, and you didn't start acting until your teens. So you credit it for like acting for you, finding your personality. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your childhood prior? Like, I know you said you were awkward wearing the Coke bottle glasses and everything, but was it something even with being homeschooled sometimes, unfortunately kids can go to church and get bullied. Was that something that you Mm -hmm. ever struggle with or fitting in? Yes, for sure. So we did, you know, we had some extracurricular activities. We'd go to like the Awana program. I don't know if you know that or like Mm -hmm. um, Sunday school. And I I wouldn't say that I like got bullied. I mean, I remember a few harsh comments because on top of on top of being the awkward homeschooler, I'm I was legally blind in my right eye. And so I had to wear a patch on my left eye. It's a really long story. But not only was I the awkward kid with glasses, but I also had a patch on my eye, like, like the one eyed girl at church or, you know, in, in the long dresses, like I was raised very, very hyper conservatively. My parents are recovered Mm -hmm. drug addicts and alcoholics. And so God bless them. They just swung the other way and were like, we're keeping you guys safe. You know, you're not going to have to be part of that world. Um, and so they went a little overboard, you know, and they would agree with, uh, agree with that. I'm not saying anything they don't know. Um, and so I was raised, I always joke and say I was raised under a rock because I just didn't know about the world. I didn't know about life outside of my tiny little community. Um, and so getting into theater was a good kind of getting my toes wet because I started in children's theater. Like theater can be a very dark place. I'm not going to lie. The entertainment world can be a very dark place. Um, but getting into children's theater and then Christian youth theater was kind of stepping my toes into, um, a safe space to learn and grow my craft, um, before kind of getting into more of the secular side of things. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was very, uh, 
a very sheltered upbringing, but because of that, there was a lot of learning I had to do later on in life that was pretty painful uh, yeah. because we all have to learn those things at some point, you know? Yeah. And for you breaking out of that kind of homeschool bubble, I guess we'll mm -hmm. call it, what was it like breaking out of that awkward stage of life and really starting to discover who Michael and Hansen actually is, um, going out, being in the world, realizing like, okay, I really have an act and a calling for this on my mm -hmm. life. So I really want to pursue it with everything I have. Like, I guess what I'm trying to ask is for the person that's listening right now, maybe they were homeschooled and they're like, oh, I'm always going to be awkward or <laughs> I, I've i recently had a glow up and I don't know yeah. how to handle real life. What would your message as someone who's been through it be to them? Have good people around you. Like that mm -hmm. will always be what I go to. Have good mentors and listen to your mentors. Like you don't have yeah. to do everything, you know, word for word, what they say, but listen to them, you know, like if they're good people, if they love you, if they love Jesus, like they're going to be doing their best to point you to what is best and healthiest for you. Um, but also step out there, stretch yourself. Also know that it is okay to mess up. I wish I would have known it was okay to mess up because I dealt horribly with codependency which is kind of a fancy word for like compulsive people pleasing. Like I would somehow in my mind, I would justify lying in order to keep somebody safe, to keep people emotionally safe. I could lie, but so long as it was like keeping people safe, like it wasn't malicious. So it was okay, you know, or just so that I didn't, wasn't perceived as like the screw up or so that I didn't hurt somebody. And like, that's not, that's not love. That's you self-protecting yourself, you know, because if somebody thinks ill of me, like I I'm nothing, you know, like you've got to have yeah. enough worth in who you are, who Christ has created you to be, to know that you can mess up royally. You can face plant and he's going to be there to love you. And there's grace for that. Cause I would, I would think there was grace for everybody else except me, you know? And so I just couldn't screw up. And I think a lot of, especially if you're raised in a very conservative, like, um, uh, legalistic home, I think rules are a big deal. And like messing up is like unthinkable. And, um, yeah. So I just say, have grace for yourself, but surround you with people who will call you out when you mess up, but also pick you up when you mess up and walk you through that forgiveness process and that recovery process from the screw up, you know, because there's a lot mm. of anxiety that comes along with, at least for me, like so much, still so much anxiety. And I've gone through years of therapy to work through a lot of this stuff, but there's still so much anxiety around messing up. And I'll do yeah. so much to just try to negate any potential mess ups, you know? And like, you can't, you can't live life cleaning up a mess you haven't created, you know, like just wow. don't yeah. waste your time doing that, you know? Yeah. And I've found myself in that before, like, and actively, like, you're like, God, I shouldn't have done that. And you beat yourself up about it. But mm -hmm. all you're doing is causing yourself more stress. So giving yourself mm -hmm. grace is so big in your life. And one of the things I want to touch on with you is growing up with chronic illness and mm -hmm. pursuing your calling through it. Because like for you in particular, Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. um, so many people out there struggle on a daily basis with the same exact thing. Yeah. And I think it's super encouraging to have such a strong woman, like actively pursuing her career and chasing the God giving calling that you have on your life. It can't be easy. It's not something that you can kind of pace yourself for, but you can actively learn how to overcome these symptoms on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. what did that look like for you? And for someone out there that thinks that that's a huge roadblock that they'll never be able to get past what would your yeah. message be to them? Oh man. Uh, so I wasn't officially diagnosed with Crohn's disease until I was like 25, I believe 24, 25. Um, I know I had been dealing with symptoms of it for years prior. I just didn't understand like w what was going on. Cause it kind of came on gradually. And when your body's in a lot of pain for a long period of time, you forget what normal feels like. Um, but that was also right when I was really starting to pursue film. Like, um, I was diagnosed, I think like the year before I got the role in like arrows. Like I remember sitting on set in like arrows and God bless Mary Smith was a makeup artist. And I was sitting there like crying cause I was in so much pain 
and she's doing my makeup and I, tears running down my face, ruining the makeup that she just did. And she's, you know, fixing it. And, you know, my, my biggest, I don't know. It's what I can encourage people with is that let it's okay for people to know that you're struggling. It's okay for people to know you're not okay. I think that was partly why not saying that like God gave me this disease, but like he allowed it in my life because I think he needed me to know like, Hey, you're not superwoman. You can't do everything. You need people. And I always wanted to be the person there for everybody else. It was really, really hard for me to ask for help or admit like, Hey, I can't do this right now. Like, Mm. and I remember when I was first diagnosed, I was in shock for sure. And you know, a few weeks or months into it, I just remember sitting on my bed and just kind of like screaming and crying and being like, okay, joke's over. Like I'm done. Like I can be better now. Right. Like this isn't, this isn't funny anymore. Like I'm really done. Like I'm really, I've always been, you know, I grew up in the big, you know, like country girl, like do it yourself. Like I've lived on my own since I was 18, you know, like I didn't really need people, but I would just say like, people love you and they want to be there for you. And also I think for me, everything I truly believe it's kind of cliche. I think we hear it a lot now, but like, I truly believe everything happens for you, not to you, but Mm -hmm. it is, that's a mind shift. You have to see it that way in order for it to, for that to work for you, if that makes sense, you know, because I could, and I, for a while, I definitely lived in the victim mentality. It was like, Oh, poor me. Like, Oh, I have such a good sob story now, you know, and I would use it a hundred percent. Like I needed it for a little while to be like, Oh yes, please just feel bad for me. Like, Oh, I'm so strong. I know I'm dealing with this so well, like I'm humble, you know, like it was a thing, but realizing that, I don't know. It just, what, what can I learn from this and what, how can I use this? to help other people. My friend, Sarah Hammett, do you know Matt and Sarah Hammett? Yeah. I feel yeah. Like you would know them. Great okay. friends. Yeah. Yes, great friends. They're wonderful. So Sarah and I've talked a lot about, you know, their journey with Bowen and his heart and everything. And, yeah. um, I love what she says. She said it best is she said, pain is going to happen regardless. I just don't want to waste the pain, whether that's physical pain, emotional pain, whatever it is, like, don't waste it, lean into it, and see what it's telling you. If it's physical pain, it's telling you there's a problem, you know? So how can we help our body in this journey? I chose to go a holistic route. I chose not to go on medication for it because I didn't feel like my body was lacking a medication. I'm not saying medication is wrong. I did medication for a little while, but I wanted to try to give my body what it needed to fight this disease, you know? And it took years and years to come on. And so I knew it was going to take years to heal. Um, And so just be patient with yourself and know that it's, it's nothing is forever, even though this disease for me, it is an incurable disease. It's something that really keeps me in check. If I'm not taking care of myself mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, my body lets me know because otherwise I'll just override it and just plow through it and be like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. You know? Um, but my body will stop me and be like, okay, okay. I'm listening. I'm sorry. Like, what do you need? You know, like, okay, I'll slow down. I will reconnect, you know, like, you've got to support the body that's supporting you, you know? Yeah. And I have hypothyroidism. So figuring oh, out like, okay. I had to learn different things about myself to work with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you don't take care of hypothyroidism, one of the huge um, issues that I saw with, like, even before I was diagnosed, they were like, oh, you've got panic disorder. And it turns out like that was a mm-hmm. symptom of the hypothyroidism. So uh, mm-hmm. it's also incurable. So you have to stay on medication for it for your whole life. And it kind of mm-hmm. just balances out. But there's also things in my diet. Um, there's triggers and also mm-hmm. stress. So I have to keep oh, gosh, myself yeah. in check because with running a marketing agency and working on a ton of projects at one time, it's so easy to find myself getting overwhelmed. And it's also like, even for doing live events, like those stress me out, but they're my favorite Mm -hmm. thing in the world. And the funny thing is about those, like when I'm emceeing a concert, like I'm the most comfortable me, like being on (laughs) stage and making people laugh, like scream, whatever. I, I'm fine when I get there, but the days leading up are so bad for me. And I've realized that. And I'm like, okay, 
I'll want to call out like two days before, one day before on the way there. Like, I can't do this. But once I get there, I'm fine. It's literally like, can we put me to sleep for the days leading up, maybe the week? (laughs) And we're good. But Uh that's just one of those things I've had to learn to roll with the punches and get through. And it's so refreshing to hear, not that you're in pain, but like, that there are also people out there that have to like learn to live with this stuff and yeah. that are actively seeking holistic approaches to this. And like you said, like medication is not the devil or anything. It's just, Mm-mm. it's a decision that you make for yourself and you find what works for you. It's not a mm-hmm. one size fits all. It's not a blueprint that we could find. And God's made us all so unique that something that works for me might not work for you. Something that works for you might not work for me. And that's Absolutely. the beauty about, about diversity, especially when it comes to our culture in general, uh, whether it's secular, Christian, wherever you're in right now, like you have a purpose. I believe mm-hmm. that God has a plan for every single one of us and he's actively working within us. And that's just the beauty about all this. That's the beauty about this show, getting to dive into these stories behind the people that we see on screen or hear mm-hmm. on the radio. It, it it was always something in the back of my head that I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. But as you could probably relate, I never saw it actually happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just God's working on each and every single one of us in such unique and diverse ways. Are we willing to drop everything and go for it? And from an outsider perspective, it looks like you're actively doing that. And I know that a lot of people are going to be encouraged by your story and that everything you've shared with us has a purpose through the struggles, through the heartache, through the awkward seasons. Like Mm -hmm. there's something in this for a a little bit of something for everyone in this. So Micah, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today and sharing about the movie and all the fun projects you're working on. And then also diving into the vulnerability about your life, because I truly believe that your story can save lives and heal so many people from symptoms that they're struggling with on a daily basis whether it's mentally or chronically Mm -hmm. just thank you for being vulnerable with us today thank you for opening up a space where people can come and just hear from other people like it's so that's kind of what got me through honestly a lot of those seasons whether it was through chronic illness or going through a breakup or whatever it is like hearing other people talk about their experiences and knowing you're not the only one like is so valuable and you create a space where people can do that so thank you doing that facilitating of course of course and to everyone that is listening or watching on youtube thank you so much for just coming week after week we couldn't do this without you and thank you to new release today for making this episode happen as usual and also the whosoevers love those guys love them so much (laughs) and uh yeah we'll talk to you guys next week i know 